happiness from scratching an itch and happiness from the itch being cured. To help review the Buddhist perspective on happiness, let us examine once more the passages in the Gandhya Sutta. This teaching outlines the development of happiness, beginning with the pleasures experienced by infants up to the supreme happiness of Nibbana. In this sutta, the Buddha describes the pursuit and experience of various kinds of happiness in people's lives. <coughs> to begin with, the newly born infant lying in its cradle may giggle and find delight by smearing its own urine and excrement. A few years later, this child no longer finds pleasure in such activity. Rather, he or she likes to play in a sandbox or in the dirt and enjoys playing with toys like dolls or miniature cars, trains or aeroplanes. Children find themselves... Children find tremendous delight in toys, cherishing and clinging to them. <coughs> Some people have a favourite blanket, and no matter how ragged or soiled it is, they cherish it intensely. If someone acts to take it away from them, they will scream as if their life depended on it. Children then develop into young adults, at which time these toys are no longer considered amusing. They provide them with no pleasure or satisfaction. Instead, people derive another level of pleasure from enjoyment by way of sense contact, by way of sights, sounds, smells, tastes and tangible objects. From here, happiness can be developed further, yet if people fail to develop higher forms of happiness and stop at the level of sense pleasure, before long they will experience an inevitable despair but at the very least, they will no longer be able to enjoy these pleasures and will encounter great suffering and affliction. Those people who develop higher forms of happiness experience a refined joy independent of pleasurable sense objects. They reach a free, unconstrained happiness and become truly liberated. When these liberated individuals observe others who indulge in sense pleasure, they no longer consider this enjoyment of sense pleasure as a form of satisfaction. Their attitude towards sense pleasure has changed. Similarly, similar to how an adult looks at children delighting in their toys, although they understand this delight, they look upon it with humour and sympathy. As mentioned earlier, the Buddha used the metaphor of a leper to describe this development of happiness. Lepers feel extreme itchiness due to the disease. As a result, they scratch at their lesions, yet this scratching only intensifies the itch. The more they scratch, the more they itch. The more they itch, the more they scratch. Moreover, they derive a sense of pleasure from scratching. Because the discomfort, they also seek relief by burning their lesions by fire. <coughs> they find happiness and satisfaction by burning themselves, which ordinary people would find intolerable. The Buddha once asked a Brahmin, what would happen if a leper met a doctor with an effective medicine, resulting in the cure of his illness? Would this person cured of leprosy still seek happiness from scratching or desire to burn himself with a flame? The Brahmin answered that just the opposite would occur. If someone were to grab this man and pull him towards a flame, he would struggle desperately to escape. The Buddha pointed out how the development of happiness is similar. So 
someone who has experienced the happiness superior to sense pleasure no longer considers the enjoyment of sense objects as a source of satisfaction. One can say that a percentage of human beings derive happiness from scratching an itch. Those people who have developed themselves to another level derive happiness from a freedom from itching. <coughs> Consider which of these kinds of happiness is superior. Does a healthy person free from illness consider this state of health, this state of well-being to be happiness? Is not, is not such freedom from illness, freedom from affliction, freedom from chaffing, itching and physical pain a true state of happiness? The state of physical health, free from weakness and irritation, in which all of one's organs function well, is an inherent state of happiness. Indeed, such health, such freedom from affliction, is a basic primary form of happiness, aspired to by all people. No matter what sort of happiness people aim for, and no matter how abundant are their material possessions, if they are deprived of physical health, their objects of sense, pleasure, gradually lose importance. Regardless of how bountiful are their objects of sense, pleasure, if people are impaired or ravaged by physical illness, these things lose all of their value. Moreover, if their happiness was invested in these things, the illness will only intensify suffering and lead to a sickness of heart. Let us turn our attention to the mind, a mind that is satisfied, spacious and joyous and bright, free from vexation and disturbance, is inherently complete. Such a state of mind is in itself happiness. In the same way as physical health is a form of happiness. In fact, this happiness is even greater than that of physical health. Yet, since it is more refined, most people do not recognize it. Take, for example, those people who are in excellent physical health. No amount of material pleasures can provide them with happiness if they are in great mental distress. The contrary is also true. Someone whose mind is bright, cheerful and free is happy even when nothing is happening. And, we, and when he or she abides in the most ordinary and routine circumstances. <coughs> Enjoyment of sense pleasures without affliction. Normally speaking, sense pleasure and more refined kinds of happiness are incompatible. This is because sense pleasure is tied up with arousing and stimulating sense objects, accompanied by agitation and anxiety and dependent on external things for gratification. Refined happiness, on the other hand, brings, begins with peace of mind. The happiness of jhana, for example, arises when the mind is first secluded from sensuality and secluded from unwholesome states. Therefore, it is difficult for ordinary people to enjoy both sense pleasures and more refined forms of happiness, especially the happiness of jhana, because whatever they delight in, they also tend to attach to and indulge in. <coughs> when they are agitated and confused by the power of sense of desire, it is difficult for them to enter into the happiness of jhana. There are many stories of hermits and renunciants falling away from jhana because of an infatuation for sense pleasure. Only when one is a noble being, beginning with stream entry, can one enjoy sense pleasures safely. 
For this reason, the Buddha repeatedly encouraged people to develop wisdom and have a proper relationship to sense pleasure. Only then can one escape from its power and influence. In the Pasarasi Sutta, the Buddha compares the five objects of sense pleasure to a hunter's snare. This teaching pertains to three groups of ascetics and brahmins. First group, those ascetics and brahmins who enjoy the five cords of sensuality, karma guna, with attachment, infatuation and indulgence, without a discernment of their danger and without liberating wisdom. They are similar to a deer captured in a snare. They will meet with downfall and destruction, slaughtered by the hunter, evil-minded Mara. Second group, those ascetics and brahmins who enjoy the five cords of sensuality without attachment, infatuation and indulgence, with a discernment of their dangers and with liberate wisdom. They are similar to a deer lying on top of the snare but not caught in it. They do not meet with downfall and destruction and are not subject to being carried off by the hunter. Third group, those bhikkhus who are secluded from sensuality, secluded from unwholesome states, who have attained the level of fine material and immaterial jhana, Along with the cessation of perception and feeling, sanya we da ita niroda, and who have brought the mental tense to an end, i.e., who have experienced supreme happiness, they are called those who have blinded Mara, who consequently cannot see any trace of them. They are similar to deer who wander freely and at ease in a great forest, undetected by the hunter. From this sutta one can see that the Buddha did not simply teach to abandon an involvement with objects of sensual pleasure. He also taught a proper engagement to these things by maintaining an independence in relation to them. One thus does not become enslaved by them, and one does not permit them to cause harm, to create suffering. The, the involvement with sense objects belonging to the second group of ascetics and brahmins above is the way of practice most emphasized for general Dhamma practitioners. The key principle in this way of practice is encapsulated in the term with liberating wisdom, <coughs> which is a translation of the Pali Nisarana Panya. It refers to wisdom that knows how to lead one to freedom. <coughs> it can also be defined as wisdom escaping the enticements by craving or wisdom preventing entrapment by craving. <coughs> Commentaries generally define Nisarana Panya as an ability to reflect when using the four requisites by focusing on the true purpose, benefit or value of these things. <coughs> For example, one uses clothing primarily to ward off cold, heat, wind and biting insects to cover and to cover one's private parts not for boasting or for show. One eats food in order to keep the body strong and at ease and so that one can perform one's activities, not for amusement, intoxication or a sign of extravagance. The application of such wise reflection fosters inner dependent in independence prevents enslavement to material objects and helps to avoid the dangers of suffering stemming from spinning around in the vortex of moodiness, of joy and sorrow, pleasure and disappointment. Moreover, it generates a balanced 
use of the requisites, which is a boon for one's life. Practice endowed with liberating wisdom, Nitsaranapanya, is thus referred to as knowledge of moderation. <coughs> Someone who relates properly to sense pleasure will find it easy to access more refined forms of happiness. Such as happiness as such happiness is dependent on wholesome states of mind. When one has experienced refined happiness, this happiness then helps in turn to guide one's search for and partaking of sense pleasure, keeping it within the correct boundaries. This is because one appreciates the value of more refined happiness and when one reaches higher states of realization comprised of ever more profound forms of happiness one will not return to seek out sense pleasure again.